said, what do you want to do? And I told him, they said, no, we don't want you to do that, do something else. Okay. <laughs> um, and what they said is, do something about computer history. I go, okay, fine. So today, <laughs> my amazing, idiosyncratic, highly opinionated history of computing. All right. And so just so you know, first of all, disclaimer one, names, places, dates, other assertions may or may not be accurate or true. <laughs> all right. Because I believe with Charles McCabe that any client can have to have facts, but having opinions is an art. <laughs> all right. And disclaimer number two, just so you know, I have a very modest understanding of electricity. All right, so that for instance, uh, I know V equals IR. Uh, I remember that from something. And uh, the question is, I'm not saying what's a volt, what's an amp, what's an ohm. Um, <laughs> so basically, as far as I'm concerned, this is how it works. <laughs> all right. And now, of course, we have to have a relevant timeline to understand all the significant portions of things that happened during my talk. So there we are, the big bang occurred 14 billion years ago. And then about 4 billion years ago, the solar system was formed. And in 1948, I was born. <laughs> well, that's, what do you need to know? All right. So what I want to do is, I, it, this is, I mean, I sat down yesterday, I filled up two whole sheets of paper with stuff I could talk about. And I said, you know, it would be a lot of fun, but, you know, it'd probably be a little longer if you wanted to sit around. So instead, what I decided was I'll just pick up things that were interesting to me. And if not interesting to you, we can leave. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, no one's going to be graded. So, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things I am interested in is the early, the very early historic period, the earliest, the earliest history you have of writing, or of any kind. Well, of, of arithmetic is the, the uh, Sumerian civilization from about. 3400 to 3000 BC, they're the first ones. They invented writing, they invented mathematics, they invented everything. All right, and uh, in fact, I'm listening to those of you who know about the, um, uh, the great lecture series. I'm listening to one now on early, uh, early developments in which he his thought is that basically Indo European Egyptian civilization were all influenced by the Sumerians. Chinese did their own thing, they were sort of isolated, but. Uh, Anything that you see through the Mideast was originally was influenced by the Sumerian culture, even if the, they did hieroglyphics or something like that. So anyway, so there you got the cuneiform. Uh, the abacus came around about 200 BC as a way of doing calculations. Rosary beads, I'm Catholic. Um, about 1200. Okay. Big deal. Big deal. Big deal. Indo-Arabic in number systems, not Arabic numbers. They're Indo. All right, uh, we call it Arabic because, of course, we heard of it from the Muslim traders, uh, but they heard of it from the Indians, and of course, we didn't know that. It's actually Indo-European, Indo-Arabic number system. Um, without that, we probably couldn't have done much because, you know, quite frankly, dividing Roman numerals is real boring. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, and, and fractional Roman numerals, I don't even know how to do that. So anyway, um, so that was a big deal. That's really important. Uh, you know, you need the right notation to be able to carry things through. Uh, around 1614, uh, John Napier invented, invented, didn't invent it, was always there, but he understood and, and promoted the notion of logarithms. Um, and from those of you who ever saw Apollo 13 with slip sticks, that's all Napier stuff, right? That's all it is. All, all a logarithm is is turning multiplication into addition. You add little pieces of stick and everything comes out fine. Um, First uh, automatic calculator uh, has been attributed to Pascal of 1642. All right, let's see. So let's move forward a few couple couple centuries. All right, so now we start getting into the interesting thing. Babbage and Lovelace. Babbage and Lovelace. No, they did not have any kind of romantic affair. Though it wouldn't be inter it would be interesting if they did because she was the daughter of Lord Byron and he was sort of known for being real <laughs> wild side guy. All right. But anyway, in the early 18, or 1830s, 1840s, uh, uh, Babbage, who was the Lucasian professor of mathematics, uh, which was a seat previously held by Newton, and for those of you who watch Star Trek, will in the future be held by Data. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Babbage was a, you know, he's a top-notch mathematician. He got this idea, though, that he could create a computing machine. And what he wanted, first of all, was to create what he called the difference engine. 
Because one of the things you can do when you're building up mathematical tables, especially of things that are polynomials, you can do it by essentially difference equations, which are like differential equations for integers. All right? And so the way they would build up the tables is they would have one group of people do the, essentially the, the, regular, the raw computation, other people do it by first difference, second difference, however many difference you had to do, and eventually you're just adding constants. Once you get rid of all the exponents, you're just adding constants. All right, so, uh, so he created an engine to do that. The difference is he got a grant from the government, and like all good researchers, as soon as he got the money, he spent it on something else. <laughs> um, and what he decided to spend it on was his dream, which was the analytical engine. And this is, by all accounts, the first recognizable general digital computer. All right, it was all in decimal, it was all done with gears and pulleys and all that kind of garbage. Uh, it was programmed, you know, it was to be, was to be programmed with essentially punched cards. Um, uh, because those were common because they were used for weaving loops. That's a shot card loop. Um, and uh, so he was promoted. He never could get it done, and there's arguments about why. I mean, eventually the government cut off his funding, but <laughs> the reason, the reason he was unable to do it, um, was basically that the mechanical engineering of the day was not up to the tolerance as he needed to be able to do this thing. Right? However, he got um, one of the people who got interested in this was Augusta uh, Ada Lovelace, Lovelace, and. Um, uh, she was a top-notch math, mathematician on her own right at a time in which, obviously, that was something that women just didn't do, but she was. She was really top-notch. And she got interested in it, worked with Babbage, and actually has been credited with writing the first recognizable program. She wrote a program to compute Bernoulli <coughs> numbers, the Bernoulli numbers, uh, showing how that would be done on the analytical engine if they could actually build it. All right? And so the two of them sort of launched this, this stuff. And um, so there, you know, they're, that's sort of our, our, our intellectual forebears, the ones that sort of hone in on what we do, goes back to um, Babbage and, and Lovelace. And in fact, those, some of you may have heard of the Ada programming language. It's not used a lot in academia anymore, but it is used a fair amount in, in, uh, still in the government and in the Defense Department. Then it was named after. Um, uh, uh, Lady Lady Lovelace. So, skipping forward a few more decades, we come to Herman Hollerith. Now, okay, uh, Hollerith was a me mechanical engineer out of uh, MIT. He made a lot of inventions, but one of his biggest invention was for the 1890 census. Uh, the census, uh, I don't know what we had, 35, 40 million people in the United States at the time. And the Census Bureau did this quick back of the envelope calculation and realized that by the time they got all the census forms in and tabulated them, it would be 1901. <laughs> right? this, didn't, this didn't bode well for the future. So they put out a competition and Hollerith won it with a, ca a tabulating machine based again on punched cards. All right? You'd bring in the, you know, the census workers would bring things in, they'd punch it on cards, and this would tabulate things along the various columns. Right, from which we get something that probably none of you have ever seen, but was very familiar to me as a child, and that's a Halworth, okay, 80 column punch card. All right, and you used to get these in the mail with your uh, your water bill, your electricity bill, whatever it was, and I always had stamped on them. Don't don't do not fold spindle or mutilate. Um, so this was this was the the first input device that I well actually it was the first input device I worked on for large systems was using a uh, punch card. Basically, a punch card had you know, 80 columns, 12 uh, rows. Uh, the, uh, the holes in the rows basically represented you know, ones and zeros, pretty obvious stuff. He sent it to a card reader that would read them either optically or by uh, magnetic brushes. Um, if you were a real wise guy, like one of my friends was at, our, at uh, UB, we, we, you never came in with like this many cards, right? You, you know, think of a 10,000 line program, you have boxes of cards, right? Let's you come in with your boxes of cards, and you'd feed them in, and you'd wait around for an hour, and then you'd bring out your listing, and you'd find that a syntax error on the first line, and you'd start all over. <laughs> all right? Uh, paid, paid to be very good, and you know, 
That's why I focus on you know, paying a lot of attention to what you're doing, because it was costly <laughs> to make a mistake. You know? uh, when I was, in fact, when I was at Fisher, we had a small computer. We, had, we got one turnaround a day. Right? So you don't make mistakes. <laughs> you make a lot of time making certain that what you wrote it does not have any mistakes. Um, the other thing is, uh, hold on, hold on. oh, uh, another interesting story about this jump forward 100 years. Um, uh, Barry Bain, who we'll see later as one of the people uh, that I'll mention in software engineering, uh, was a, one of the program leads on one of the Apollo, I think it was Apollo, maybe it was Mercury, one of the early space missions, I don't think it was Apollo. It was probably either Mercury or Gemini in the 70s. And one of the things, obviously, when you put something in a uh, capsule that you're going to put people in and then shoot them at the top of a rocket as far as possible, <laughs> weight matters a lot. All right? So everything that was on the manifest had to be accounted for in terms of its weight. So they went around, here's the computer, blah, 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 and they came up to BAME and they said, okay, how much does the software weigh? Is <laughs> the software doesn't weigh anything. <laughs> they said, well, it's got to weigh, we have software, yes, it's necessary, absolutely necessary. But it's got to weigh something. He goes, no, the software doesn't weigh anything. All right? So the guy who was doing the audit says, this is driving me nuts, he goes away, comes back later, and he brings a box of these things. And he says, is this the program? Because I can weigh this. And uh, Bane says, yes, the program, the program is the holes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's how we're at. Now, now we start getting into people you may have heard of. <clears throat> Uh, certainly if you're taking any classes from me. <laughs> uh, Kirk Girdle and Alan Turing. Um, both of them are very tragic endings to their lives, as it turns out. But uh, if you want, I'll talk a little bit about that. But Gert, you'll notice, okay, notice the date of which they made their, their major insight and the date at which they, which they were born. Kirk Girdle was 25, Alan Turing was 24. You're already behind the eight ball. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Um, what Girdle said is, well, here's, I'll give you the background, all right. He hung around with a bunch of people in Vienna, all right, including uh, Wittgenstein in his first incarnation as a philosopher. And these people tend to be what's called logical positivists. And how many people know what logical positivism is as a philosophy? They don't teach that over They must teach it over there. All right, anyway. The basic idea behind logical positivism, it's sort of related to what we call scientism, which is if you can't prove something either true or false, then it's a meaningless statement. You know, does God exist? Can't prove a true or false, meaningless statement. All right? And Gödel got upset by this. He said, because you know, he was platonic with ideals and all this stuff. He says, something doesn't fit, sit right with me. He was a top-notch logician. And his contribution, and I think this is the key contribution that launched sort of the way we think about computing today, in which what most of us do has nothing to do with numbers. Nothing to do with numbers. All right? Is he represent, recognized the numbers were not just numbers. They could represent concepts. Okay? And to give you the 30-second rule, what Gödel did is he said, look, all right, how do you prove something? Well, you have some axioms, things that you assume to be true, and there were Oh, I can't remember now, but in Principia Mathematica by Russell and Whitehead, there were about 13 axioms, something like that. All right, so you got axioms. Those are theorems that are true by definition. Okay? Or you can do, you know, think of the same thing in Euclid's axioms for geometry. So you got axioms. These are true. You've got rules of deduction, how you can take two things that are true and deduce something new that's true. That's called proof. All right? The, line, the chain of argument is the proof of a theorem. All right? So he said, well, how many things do I need to represent all of the statements in uh, uh, Principia Mathematica? He goes, well, I can code them real easily. What do I have? I have parentheses. I have upside down A's. I have propositions, PQ, you know, propositions. I have variables, blah, blah, blah. He does the arithmetic. He says, it comes out, you need something like 14 symbols. He says, great. OK, give me each a number. Now, how do I represent a statement, you know, a, a claim? an axiom or a theorem. Well, you simply take the numbers and you multiply each one. The first position is multiplied by the first prime, the second one by the second prime. You know, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. Right? So you're guaranteed by the unique factorization theorem 
that every proposition has a unique representation. Okay? All right, cool. Then what he said, well, what's a chain of argument? Well, there's simply a set of these things separated by semicolons, you know, say first step, second step. So he added semicolon to his, his little vocabulary, and pretty soon he could represent as an extremely big number, but a, a finite number nonetheless, any chain of reasoning. And then his insight was to say, well, what is it that we do when we create a new theorem? Well, we transform one number into another number. And he came up with the function that could transform the right numbers. In other words, if this actually was a relation, but if you apply this to a well-known existing theorem, anything that comes out is itself got to be true. So that means the proper, the actual proof itself could be represented as arithmetic operations. Okay, which were encoded in this language that he had. So he had a self-referential system. And to cut things, cut to the chase, basically what he proved is there are well-defined statements in first-order predicate calculus, is what you need to do uh, in your arithmetic. There are well-defined statements which we know are true in the semantic sense, but we can't prove by any kind of mechanical procedure because basically they're self-contradictory, all right? Essentially, you end up with a statement that says, you can't prove me, <laughs> all right? And of course, if you can, then your system's in, then you basically can prove something you couldn't prove, so your system's inconsistent, but if you can't prove it, then obviously it's true and you can't prove it, all right? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. If you want to know more about this, and I, you know, want to turn your head inside out for a couple days, um, <laughs> Uh, the, the best book that sort of covers all of this and the notion of recursion within itself is a book that's about 30 years old now called Gödel Escher Bach by, by Douglas Hofstadter, which talks about the self-referential systems. Anybody who knows Escher prints, you know, where he, two hands are drawing each other and this sort of thing, that's a recursive system. And Bach, as it turned out, wrote all sorts of interesting things that were self-referential. For instance, he wrote a violin... Uh, piece for two violins in which there was one piece of paper with, the, with, this, with one set of notes. You hung it up, one person played from one side, one person played from reverse, and it came out right. I mean, that's kind of cool. All right, so you read that, and Hofstetter also has a book just on Gödel's theory. Gödel's theory. He took um, a book that had been around since the 1950s and did some editing on it to bring it up to date. So you just want to learn that you can. All right, so Gödel is that. He, uh, He's, uh, what, 25 at the time. Uh, he goes on to go to, on the basis of that, he went on to Princeton, became a great buddy of Einstein's. He and I, they got all sorts of pictures of the two of them wandering around Princeton together. Uh, and, but eventually he just completely went bonkers, nuts. He was, afraid, he was absolutely convinced that people were trying to start, trying to kill him, that his food was being poisoned, so he didn't eat, so he died essentially of starvation, just refused to eat. Um, all right. Now, Gödel does this a couple years later, five to be exact. Uh, Alan Turing looking to do his senior thesis. Jeez. All right, graduate. <laughs> <laughs> says, "Oh, that, that kind of thing of I wonder what that means about what can be computed. All right, what can we compute? Given that, all right. So using essentially the same technique that Gödel did, he came up with this universal machine, numbered all of the basic. You, those of you who've taken CS theory know how." Turing machines work, um, which you may or may, I don't know how far they go in CS theory, but basically you can number every machine, and then by, since every machine has a number, it can be interpreted by a universal Turing machine, uh, and you take that machine and you set it on itself, or you set it on a, a, a program which says, uh, tells you whether a program holds or not, and basically at the end you have a program to say, if the guy who got here says I halted, then I loop forever, and if the guy says I got here, says I loop forever, I stop. All right? And you have the same kind of contradiction. And that's why, for instance, we can't write programs which in general can determine whether a loop will ever terminate, or recursion which is general. All right? Brilliant. I mean, the man was absolutely brilliant. About the same time, there were two other brilliant people working um, uh, in the same field. Um, one was Markov, who was Russian. You may have heard of Markov's chains and all this, but he also did stuff in terms of computation. He captured his computation in terms of 
uh, manipulating strings, looking for like regular expressions, but bigger than that. Manipulating strings, string transformations. And at the same time, Alonzo Church, who died not that long ago, um, did a whole thing on recursive function theory, lambda functions, lambda, lisp. <laughs> yeah. All right? Uh, and what has been shown is that their two formulations are exactly equivalent to Turing's. In the sense, if you've got a Turing machine, you can simulate the other two and vice versa. All right? Um, and there's, what is this? Well, there's all sorts of people on register. People keep trying to develop a machine which is more powerful than Turing's, and they can't. All right? <laughs> So the Turing hypothesis is that um, you know you can't you know you can't come up with a machine which would uh, compute these incomputable numbers. All right, people say, well, well oh, how about this one? But not Turing can simulate that, so you know. Yeah. So they basically give it up. They believe. All right, uh, Turing then went on. Well, we'll see this in a minute. Let me see what's the next one. Yeah, World War II. All right. So World War II saw the rise of simple mechanical computers, ballistic computers. They um, uh, were based on essentially mechanical incorporation of differential equations. That's how you found the range to something. All right, and uh, and on, this is on a submarine. Uh, so if you're on a boat, you've got to account for you know doing you know what boats do. What what the deadliest catch? All right, <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to, you to pay attention to them. And uh, so the the earliest the early, those were analog computers, but they were computers. All right. Um, Richard Feynman, one of my heroes, okay, great physicist, probably the greatest American physicist of the 20th century, um, worked on the Manhattan Project out in, in um, uh, New Mexico, uh, and he had his computers, his computers were men and women who went around and fed punch card machines to do the calculations that had to be done. Uh, you, if you're interested, he has a great uh, lecture and eventually was written down about his years at New Mexico, part of which is a discussion of how they did the computations that had to be done. They got a lot of very bright young men and women, all right, and he just let them loose. And pretty soon they wouldn't let them in. They, but you, all the stuff you see today, pipelining, you know, parallel and things coming back, map reduce, all that stuff was there in 1945. It was just being done with cards. <laughs> in, 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 that, that Essentially, yeah, you know, you split out and you bring all of that together. That's map reduce, right? <laughs> okay, and loops because you go through one machine and come back around again to get the next. You know, because they were they do simple machine could do division or it could do multiplication or it could do addition or it could do <laughs> subtraction, and so you had all these. You know, you just pipeline them along. Okay, what's amazing is I think you're going to see is a lot of the things we talk about as being so cool today, but around forever. All right. Okay. Um, meanwhile, over in Britain, Alan Turing's brain has been turned to uh, Bletchley Park, which was the code-breaking center for uh, uh, the British government, um, and they broke the Enigma code. Now, the Enigma looks like a typewriter. It was given to high units within the German army. One of them was stolen by a Pole who managed to get out of Europe in time and turn it over to the British. So they understood the principle on which it worked. However, that wasn't enough. <laughs> and the reason was, you see these three guys here? These are rotors. And what would happen is every day there would be a rotor combination of the day. So before you sent your first message, you put the rotors in that position. Every time you hit a key, those rotors would, cha would change in a predictable but seemingly random manner. Okay, so what came out, <laughs> okay, what came out didn't look like anything like what went in. It was a very good statistical mixing properties. So you could use this to securely send stuff to, you know, the guys in the Western Russian front, you know, don't freeze or something. <laughs> uh, too late. Uh, too late, right? <laughs> okay, and the... So the Brits knew the principle, but unwinding it was difficult. If you got two of these things, these things synchronized, it's trivial. But if you don't know the three characters, so you have to find the code. And you do that, those of you who know anything about breaking uh, ciphers, and if you don't, uh, read the, um, uh, the Code Breakers, which is an old book, but it's about this thick, and it's just incredible the way people break codes. Um, but if you know anything about it, you know, a huge combinatorial problem here. 
So originally, eventually, they said, well, there's certain things we can key in on. For instance, the uh, one thing you learn is that uh, the guy, the, the generals are sending the messages, but the corporals are typing them. All right? And so <laughs> the corporals tend to be, well, you've seen, watch MASH, right? They tend to be lazy, right? <laughs> Don't have to do any more than they want, right? So there are all sorts of protocols. For instance, when you fired up the machine in the morning, or started a new message, you were supposed to hit a whole bunch of what are called nulls, which are like spaces. All right, a random number of them. Okay? Well, that takes time. So you don't do it. Well, that means then, if, since all orders begin pretty much the same, general so-and-so to general so-and-so fire, you know, attack now, well, the general so-and-so to general so-and-so is pretty well known. If you can decode that, then you can basically reverse engineer the setting of the rotors. Okay? So that's, you know, that's what they did at Bletchley Park. And eventually they built the first, the first known general purpose computer called the BOM, which was developed by Turing, which automated this. Okay. Which automated, it was basically, I think it was, it had 16 different decoding cycles it could go through. So it could try 16 different code combinations at the same time. All right. And given that the generals, that the Germans basically thought this was impenetrable, all right, and the first thing you do is you commit, oh yeah, we can't read anything you're doing now. Mm -hmm. All right? Uh, some of you may have heard that early in the war when the Luftwaffe was bombing uh, Britain, uh, they basically destroyed Coventry. They, they basically took the city of Coventry and demolished it. And the British knew it was coming, but they, oh, if they sent planes up, the Germans would know that they could break their code. All right, that was one of the toughest decisions that Churchill made during the war. Okay? So anyway, all right. So Turing does all this neat stuff. At the end of the war, he writes the Turing test. How many of you heard of the Turing test in AI? You know, the ability to, how can I tell whether I'm talking to a computer or a human? He came up with that idea. And people have attacked it back and forth. But it was the first idea of maybe these things can think. He came up with some really deep insights into the biological relationship to computation, which biologists within the last 10 or 15 years have just begun to understand that he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> right? And then in 1954, he was a homosexual. And he was caught in the act uh, with another man, so it wasn't a child. Uh, but because of that, he was A, declared a security risk, which meant he couldn't do any of this stuff anymore. Uh, he was sent to, he was, and he was given the choice of either going to jail or taking um, uh, sex suppressing uh, drugs, which caused his breast to grow and all this stuff. And uh, in what can only be described as a fit of depression, he ate a cyanide, cyanide laced apple in 1954 and committed suicide. All right? Uh, bad karma, really bad karma. We were really stupid back then. Uh, but as most of you know, the most prestigious award in computing from the Association for Computing Machinery is the Turing Award, given in his, in his honor. All right. So, so post-World War II. Well, this stuff, so, start, stuff starts picking up. So, all right. Here's the ENIAC one. I just thought this is what a computer used to be. All right. And it had, at a 20 microsecond clock, 200 microsecond clock, it was about, oh, a thousand times less powerful than the machine that you had sitting right there. That, but it did weigh 30 tons. Uh, <laughs> it had a vast memory of 20 digits. Okay. It had a mean time to failure of two days and mean time to repair of 15 minutes. You better hope that your calculation didn't take two and a half days. <laughs> okay. So that was, the, that was the first, one of the first computers. Uh, this is John von Neumann. Many, uh, how many of you have taken the computer, what, the, I don't know what they call it in computer engineering anymore, but the basic hardware course. All right. Have you heard about what a von Neumann computer is? Yeah, well, that's him. <laughs> um, another one of the mathematical geniuses of the, uh, the 20th century. Made contributions to quantum mechanics, game theory, Everything he touched turned to gold. <laughs> uh, worked on the Manhattan Project and all that. Uh, developed the notion for how to afford, how to put together a computer, which is what we have today with the AOU and the memory and the I.O. and all that stuff. And there he is with his first computer, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, the computer they built, which was called the Johnny Act, because it was his. And so this is his basic idea of how things went. 
what we call the universal constructor. He called the universal constructor, we call the ALU today. All right? Okay. So, uh, and von Neumann also died in 57 of uh, cancer, and there was some reason to believe, no one can prove it, some reason to believe that he, he witnessed so many uh, nuclear and thermonuclear explosions as part of his working for the Department <coughs> of Defense that, you know, the radiation uh, led to his cancer. So he, he died much too young, he was only you know, 54. He used to make, in 1954, he made $600 a day as a consultant, you know. This is the time when my father was making about $1,000, $1,500 a year, all right? Good! <laughs> Get be good, it works to your advantage. All right. Now, here are two of my heroes. I don't know if you know who they are, but i got to tell you about them because both of them were extremely nice to me early <laughs> in my career. All right? They also were pioneers. One's Morris Wilkes and the other's Grace Murray Hopper. Uh, Admiral Hopper was the first female programmer of the Harvard Mark I. She graduated there to work for Remington Rand, Univac Remington Rand, and she actually invented, she and her team invented the first compiler, a language called A0, which looks very, it was business oriented, it looked very similar to COBOL. And a lot of the ideas that eventually showed up in COBOL were originally uh, in the A0. Um, soon after she invented that, she got on the Codicil Committee, which is the one that actually formalized and developed COBOL from her language and one, a similar one from IBM. And she is just a dynamite old broad. I mean, I, <laughs> I, her. I saw her probably. You know, first of all, she was absolutely the most patriotic person you could imagine. I mean, she walked, she was just so proud to be, uh, uh, when I saw her, she was a captain in the, in the, uh, the Navy. She eventually retired as a rear admiral. Um, and she was, in, she was active duty in the Navy her entire life. She died, when she died, she was still active duty. Um, and uh, she used to walk, her great thing is she used to have what she called her nanosecond wires. All right, she, and I got, I had one, I can't find it anymore. It drives me nuts. But she'd walk in to a room. First time I saw her was in 1969. I had went. To, it was my first computing conference ever. Okay, I was still a senior in, in college at Fisher. Went to a conference in in Albany, uh, which was a great conference. But she was there as one of the keynote speakers, an ACM conference keynote speaker. As the first time I saw her, she walked. Her, she'd walk around with her nanosecond. She'd carry 30 centimeters of wire. And she said, that's a nanosecond. <laughs> she said, here, have a nanosecond. And what she was trying to teach people was, you know, the, the effect of how long, how far things could travel, how much you had to squeeze things down to be able to get faster and faster. All right? She was fascinating. All right? And she was just very nice to me at that meeting. I went up and introduced myself. I she was the hell I was, right? And she was just very, very gracious, very gracious. The next person on the left is Maurice Wilkes. Um... Wilkes created actually the first general purpose memory storage general computer, what we today would call a, per, a general computer. It was based on the ideas from von Neumann, but he got there first. And it was the EDSAC, it was at Cambridge in 49. All right, it was the first computer based on von Neumann's architectural principles. All right, it wasn't terribly fast, 650 operations a second. It was faster than any. I right, had 3,000 vacuum tubes. It was a great invention, but the thing he was, he became extremely, most um, uh, influential was he, he was the inventor of the term microprogramming. Does anybody know what microprogramming is? What is it? Is that where you kind of program the state machine of a CPU to execute? Instructions? You got it. All right. What you do is it's writing the program that, that interprets the instruction set of the computer you're using. It's used everywhere today. All right. If you look underneath the hood of a modern Intel processor, there's a very long instruction word computer actually driving things. Okay? And he was the one who came up with the idea that the best way to put together a regular, well-engineered system was to write a program to interpret the program. Okay? And it was great. He couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, he came up with principles that would, in principle, work, but he couldn't do it in um, you know, 1949 technology when he proposed it. But it became, it's the standard way in which processors are, are done today. And not soon after, we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay? Also about the same time, you know, 
just a couple of years before my introduction to the world, uh, the ACM was formed in 1947, and the IEEE Computer Society, its predecessor, was formed in 1946. So they've been around forever. All right. So now what I'm going to do, I don't, I don't have an awful lot of more. I got some more. But, all right, what I'm doing is I'm going to go through each decade since then. I'm going to give the things that impressed me. All right? Other things impress different people. These are the things that impressed me. All right, as I go back. Now, I, you know, I was five years old when this was happening. But as I go back, I'm extremely impressed. All right, so, typical hardware in the 50s. You had memory. They could be CRTs. We had a professor here uh, when I started named Jim Carbon, who had actually worked on one of these systems, a 701, and you could actually see memory. You could look through it. It was basically a cathode ray tube. You could see the bits that were one and zero. All right? Which means they were really big bits. Okay? Um, but you can see them. All right? So you used a cathode ray tube to represent the ones and zeros. Uh, Wilkes had used what are called mercury delay lines. It was basically an acoustical system. You send an acoustic wave through it, knew how long it took to get back, <laughs> all right? And it actually acted sort of like a, like a disk drive or a drum, which constantly recirculates things, all right? Uh, the interesting thing is you had to plan ahead of time. If you wrote an instruction, you had to know how long the instruction was going to take so you could guess how far ahead, how far ahead <coughs> you had to be to get the next instruction without losing time, <laughs> all right? Because okay? it wasn't going to be the next one in line. It was going to be, you know, a few milliseconds down the road <laughs> before that one came by. All right? Um, later on, they added uh, magnetic core. At this point, there was no common data size. Like today, everything is bytes, 8-bit bytes or multiples thereof. There were 36, there were 24, there were 18, there were 6, <laughs> there were everything. All right? There was no common data size. All right? Because people were still, still trying to figure out how these things work. Okay? Uh, the processors themselves were mostly vacuum tube. Toward the end of the 50s, we had the first early transistor computers. All right? We're not talking about large scale. We're talking about individual transistors. Uh, the I.O. was uh, <laughs> confined to mag tape and punch cards and paper tape, that's paper tape, paper tape, teletypewriters, uh, and line printers. Okay? Um, give you an idea, a typical IBM 704 rented for $50,000 a month. It had 32,000 words, six bits per character. All right, and you could do 40,000 editions a second. All right, rented for $50,000 a month, and gas cost 24 cents. So you can do the arithmetic. Okay, how these things were, yeah, they took whole Hume, uh, they took whole uh, buildings uh, up in Buffalo. Um, National Gypsum used to heat their main building from the computer. <laughs> um, yeah. Software. These were the first personal computers. Why were they personal? There was no operating system. How did you do something? You went you had to take the machine over by yourself. Right? So you'd go in and you'd flip the switches and get it to boot, and away you went, and it ran. If it crashed, it crashed, and just sat there. So you got this $50,000 a month computer being used by one person, and most of the time it's not doing anything. <laughs> all right, okay, big investment, all right, so that's why early on being a programmer or software engineer was considered scut work because you were worth a heck of a lot less than that computer was, all right, <laughs> okay, so they could say you work desk, you desk checking, do all this stuff before you even approach the computer, <laughs> all right, uh, the first programming languages came out, COBOL, Fortran, uh, Algol 58, and Guess what? List. Mm -hmm. Very early in the 60s, John Kirby. Right? Now, the first operating systems, uh, GMs, uh, I can't remember what NAA stands for, but that was their first, they wrote the first operating system for a 704, 707 kind of uh, a computer. That was eventually they donated it to the IBM uh, user group, which is called Share, so it became the Share operating system. And then eventually IBM took it over and made it IP sys. But it was a batch system. That stuff in the beginning, all it did is it took the you sitting at the console away, they had an operator. So now you couldn't sit there and see what your computer, your program was doing. You took your card, you handed it to the programmer, and sometime, some time later it came back with the syntax error in line one. <laughs> all right? Okay. So, that's the 50s. But no 
out as things are moving forward. We got real programming languages here. I mean, my kid's still using this. He's on mechanical engineering. Fortran's been around forever. So doesn't look exactly like it did in the 50s, but it's been around forever. All right, so let's move up a little bit. Okay, oh, 1950s, what am I doing? I'm doing duck and cover. Anybody know what duck and cover is? <laughs> okay, fine, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I live in Verona, New York. I'm eight miles away from Griffiths Air Force Base where there is a boatload of B-52s. And I'm figuring, what am I doing this for? <laughs> if the poo is the propeller, I'm dead. I mean, you know, all this, this must just be crowd control because <laughs> or so they can count the bodies easily or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know not a chance I'm getting out of here. All right, so... Okay, so move to the 60s. This is when I started, I got involved in the late 60s, actually the summer of 1969. All right? <laughs> so, all right, all right, so I started. Uh, my, 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 between my junior and senior year in college, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Anyway, so what do we see in the way of hardware? This is where I'm going to break into hardware, software, other stuff. All right? So hardware, CDC 6000, great machine, wonderful machine, designed for high-speed computation. High in the time in the terms of the day, all right. It could do about two million instructions a second. That's pretty good. All right, it had a one mic, one milli, a one microsecond core. Had the most incredible CPU under the hood uh, that actually had multiple function units. So you talk about pipelining and all that. It had them. All right, and it had what it called the scoreboard, which was a electronic system that scheduled who got to use which unit next to guarantee that. The set that the program was executed in a way that was logically consistent with what you wrote, even though things might be done out of order. Amazing. Okay. Seymour Cray invented that. Did that it was great. It, uh, in fact, it was so powerful that you couldn't afford to put the operating system on it. So what they did is they surrounded it with ten what they call peripheral processing units, each of which was a 12-bit micro uh, mini computer at 4,096 words. And that's why the operating system sat in those ten computers. All right. <laughs> Okay, so if you wanted to make a system call, you put the name, you put the call in word zero of your address space and looped until it changed. <laughs> All right, and there was one PPU that was sitting there just watching that word. <laughs> All right, um, second thing, Burroughs. Burroughs was a great, a large manufacturer of computers in the, in the early 60s. Um, they based their computers on stacks. That is, you know, there was a it was one of the first computers which had a stack built into hardware. It was even deeper than what you see on like a 68,000 or a penny or something today. Uh, if you want to get a rough idea of what that looked like, look at the JVM as a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, the stack-based computer. All right. I did a lot of my original computer architecture work based on the, the Burroughs machine. Great machines, great machines. Fascinating. Uh, virtual memory. All right. 1960s. The Ferrani Atlas. And then General Electric and Burroughs picked it up, and by the mid-60s, everybody but the IBM was good. All right? not, I, not that IBM cared, because they had the market. All right? um, CPUs, we're now seeing small and medium-scale integrated circuits. You know, a few hundred, few thousand transistors per integrated circuit. Um, Winchester disks, the first original high-performance rotating disks, a total of 64 megabytes of storage. Uh, cache memory, you think ca cache memory has been around since the IBM 36085, which came out in 1967. All right. Uh, microprogramming, the way in which I, the only way IBM could make a line of machines, a 360 line, which scan, spanned the 36030, which was relatively cheap, the 36085, which was extraordinarily expensive, <laughs> all right, was by using microprogramming. All right. So all of those machines had the same instruction set. They just worked at radically different speeds. And they all had their own different microprocessor that simulated that 360 instruction set. Okay? Uh, let's see. The IBM 360, because of microprogramming, the IBM 360 was able to create their product line, the 360, which eventually became the 370. Virtual machines, oh, VMware, 1967, the IBM 360, 67. All right, and then if you wanted to talk to a machine, you used an acoustic coupler. This is this is a pic. This isn't what I use, but it's a picture of the same machine I used when I started in '69. I started using a time sharing machine at a bank. You would go down to where the terminal was. 
You dial a number on a phone and you plug it into the side of the machine. All right? And it would go, and on the other side there was something lift. Turn it in, you know. I mean, it's all electrical signals, but why did we have to, anybody have any idea, why did we have to put this acoustic thing in the middle? Everyone has a phone. Everyone has a phone, but why couldn't we just put bell? Direct bell, right. Back when there was the phone company, TPC, the phone company. The phone company would not let you attach anything to their phone lines, like a modem. All right? Well, you could if you paid them like $15,000. All right, cool. That's not going to work. So some quick, bright engineers realized, well, the sounds coming through are just the encoding of the, of the, uh, the electrical thing. I can decode them on the other side. And now I can use a plain old phone. Of course, it isn't very fast. The fastest, about the fastest you can do over this, about 300 watt, toward the end of their series, maybe 1,200. All right, it's 120 characters a second. I remember the first time I saw a 120 character per second terminal. I couldn't believe how infinitely fast it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how fast is something be? Amazing. But that's how you did it. You plug the phone in the side of your terminal. All right? Mike, yeah. Mike, how big were those Manchester discs that were 64 minutes? Oh, they were about they were like the size of a washing machine. We used to call them washing machines. You'd see them come out. They were what? They're the size of a washing machine. Were those the ones that you could actually get to walk across the room if you did that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, if you if you uh, if you program okay, if you could convince well, let's put it this way. If you could set up your system to set up sympathetic vibrations to hit that disc, that disc in just the right way, you could make it bounce across. <laughs> and typically, that would make the machine operators very happy, but you can do it. <laughs> All right. 60 software, what do we see? OS 360. All right, the first operating system compatible across an entire range. Fred Brooks was the project manager for OS 360. We'll talk more about him later. Multitex, which was a joint effort between MIT and General Electric, later Honeywell, to create a, uh, a time sharing system uh, based on a previous time sharing system called, C it's called CTSS. CTSS was called the Compatible Time Sharing System because um, <laughs> well, the Compatible Time Sharing System because it allowed you to work from a terminal, teletype, 10 characters a second. And by the way, you got very good at synchronizing your, your, your keystrokes with the teletype, because it was a mechanical interlock. So if you type too fast, it would just jam up on you. Right? <laughs> you know, drummers were really good typists. All right, so, uh, so that's a compatible time sharing system. You know, swap your program in, run it for a while, swap it out, swap the next program in, run it for a while. All right, Multics was to be a follow-on to that based on a processor GE made, which was, um, uh, uh, it never, it actually never, it, it worked. I mean, there are installations of it, but it never took off. It was just too big and bleh. All right. <laughs> uh, the Dartmouth time sharing system, which did take off, and in fact, that's where I learned my first program was the Dartmouth time sharing system. I think I told some of you my first, my first job in the, uh, let's see, how am I going to make this confession? All right. <laughs> Most of you know I was a math major in college at St. John Fisher. All right. I went through three years there absolutely convinced that computers were nothing but big, dumb calculators. <laughs> all right. Which was not, because that's where all mathematicians believe, they're big, dumb calculators. You know? So I thought, okay, fine, big, dumb calculators. Why, why would anybody spend their time around that kind of thing? All right. <coughs> And then, between my junior and senior year, I needed a job. My cousin happened to be working at Marine Midland, which became HSBC, which is God knows what it is now. Um, and he said, well, I'll, you know, I'll put in a word for you with the, uh, the, uh, the summer co-op, summer intern program. Okay, fine. That was good. I had my foot in the door. I wrote my resume. I sent it in, said I knew how to program. I lied. <laughs> well, I, I didn't entirely lie, because the previous year I visited one of my friends at Syracuse University, and he'd taken me into their lab where they used APL, a programming language, and I actually typed 2 plus 2, it came back for, oh, program. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I walked in, and I got a job, I walk in, there's like eight of us in this room, 
Uh, some of them get sent down to the computing center to rip apart listings all day. And the guy says, I got something different for you. Like, oh crap, what did I get myself into? This time, walked me up, and I met my boss, who was one of the most wonderful people I've ever known. He was just a great boss. Um, walked in, I was, I was a math major with an economics minor. He said, uh, we got two kinds of problems we're interested in doing. What they did is they traded all of the securities that the bank did. They bought and sold securities. At that time, all banks could buy, or buy and sell were bonds. They couldn't sell, buy and sell stocks for their own account. So it was, the, it was called the Asset Management Department. Uh, and he said, um, uh, one of the things we would like to do is some econometric forecasting. They'll help us control when we make trades. And the other thing we want to do is we want to automate some of the stuff we do around the office using this Dartmouth time sharing system, with the couple and all that stuff. Right? And I'm going, okay, econometrics, that sounds cool. That thing sounds like crap. And uh, <laughs> he says, you know, so I said, well, he said, well, let me show you. Because he had decided, he had taught himself enough to know there was, there was uh, taught himself enough basic to know that there was potential here. But that wasn't his job. He was vice president for crying out loud. Uh, so he takes me down to this room, which we shared with like five other departments, the one teletype on the floor. All right, dials a number, puts the thing on the side of the machine, it says, General Electric Time Sharing System Login, please. I can remember that so clear. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I said, crap, I've got to learn how this thing works. That's what I've been doing for 40 years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right? so that, this, is, this is just too neat, man. Right? Um, and so that summer I taught myself basic, you know, I taught myself basic. Uh, he sent me to a course I learned Fortran. Okay, uh, went back that year for my senior year at Fisher. Uh, took the one computing course that we had in the college, which was numerical analysis. All right. Now you'd think as a math major I'd like numerical analysis. Not me. I hate numbers. Numbers suck. <laughs> right? Okay. When I took mathematics, you know, calculus. Okay, that's okay. All right. Differential equations. That's boring. That's just memorization. That's how true. The basic one, right? It's just memorization. Oh God, you know. <coughs> um, real and complex analysis, numerical analysis. Just what's wrong with numbers? Who wants to do that, right? Okay. The real math, real math. It's abstract algebra, linear algebra, and topology, and geometry. That's math. I love that stuff. I loved that stuff. And that's why, of course, I had well, nothing to do with computers because I hated the numeric side of stuff. All right. Well, then I got to see that, you know, all of that I had been taught as a math, the way I had learned to think as a mathematician, all right, about organize, all those subjects teach you about objects, values and their relationship to one another, and how they evolve over time, and what properties they have, all right, formal methods, now you know why, all right, <laughs> I got, I, you know, I said, this is just, this is so cool, all right, because everything I learned as a mathematician, I could apply, not the, the, not the specific theorem, but the way of thinking to developing software. And what was neat is at the end of the day, they gave me money. <laughs> you know? All right? I was working for $2.50 an hour. I had never been so rich in my life. <laughs> All right? So, so I did that, went back to school, uh, came back the next summer, worked for the next summer. That's why I've told many of you about my, uh, my first uh, uh, entree into the need for good software engineering. When I wrote the program and the, pre the previous summer came back and couldn't fix it, so I couldn't figure out what it did in my own program. It was like a thousand lines long. It was nothing. Right? And so my boss said, okay, I'll let you rewrite it once. But you do this again, you're fired. Okay. You taught me that. All right? this, this, was the song, this was the program which I told you. It was a thousand and one lines long. A thousand lines if you didn't count the documentation. Right? Okay, so... Um, I learned, I learned fast. <laughs> okay, I learned fast. All right, so operating systems. Uh, time sharing and batch were kind of going back and, you know, battling back and forth, so time sharing was starting to become more and more valuable. Uh, now that we have virtual memory, people had to know how do you manage that resource? How do you know what to keep in memory and what to keep on disk? And this is when, you know, Peter Denning did some really great work in the late 60s on memory management algorithms about what would be an ideal one, what would be a practical one, that sort of stuff. Uh, how do you design a file system? Well, up to then, it'd been pretty easy. You grabbed a hunk of disk and it was yours. <laughs> All right. All right. But you know, you got to name them, you got to find them, you got to protect them, all that stuff. All right. Multiprogramming and multitasking. You know, more than one thing occurring at the same time. 
all right, more than one program, what we would today would call a process running at a time, and then within that multitasking, what we today would call threading. Okay, whole boatload of new languages showed up. I'm only going to show you the ones that I found historically interesting. PL1 came out of IBM. It was supposed to be the language to replace Fortran and COBOL. It replaced neither because it was, wasn't quite good enough for either one. Right? It had a lot of COBOL-like features, which drove the engineers nuts, <laughs> and it had a lot of arithmetic-type features that drove the, program, the uh, business people nuts, so it never really took off. All right? But it provided a backdrop against which a lot of language development took place later on. Uh, Snowball, one of the early string processing languages, based on where we talked about Markov, based on his algorithmic scheme, uh, that's where I learned to do string processing, regular expressions, all that neat stuff. Okay. Simula 67 came out of Norway, out of nowhere, first object-oriented language. And he had a well, first well-defined notion of objects and inheritance and all that stuff. All right, APL, language, a programming language. Language designed for doing primarily array and, and uh, matrix operations. If you know anything about R these days, very similar in, in spirit to that. Totally different syntax. You had to have a special keyboard, <laughs> all right? It literally used Greek characters, all right? So if you didn't have a, a keyboard and a type that had Greek characters on it, you couldn't read it, all right? Um, databases started to make their, their appearance with the first uh, attempt to allow people to access things in a reasonable way called ISAM, Index Sequential Access Method, came out of IBM. Um, and then HCI, we actually had the mouse. There it is. There's the first mouse. Doug Engelbart. See? Sketchpad. You know all those drawing programs you got? All right. That was done by, um, oh, God, I can't think of his name now. Ted, uh, anyway. All right. People were doing, oh, you know, to do it, you basically had to let someone give you their $10 million machine for a couple hours. <laughs> all right. Which, if you're MIT, you can do. Okay. <laughs> or Berkeley or Stanford. All right. If you're St. John Fisher, no. <laughs> okay, ain't gonna happen. All right? So that's what we saw in the in the 60s. Okay? And that's about the time I made my transition from mathematics into computing. I went to the University of Buffalo. Right? One of the reasons why I love the six thousand CDC six thousand is that was what we had at Buffalo, and I just thought it was a fascinating computer. Alright. So what about the profession? What was happening in the profession? Well, we had the first NATO conference on software engineering in 1968. So software engineering as a concept, at least as a dim vision in people's mind, had been around, it's been around since 1968. ACM published the first undergraduate curriculum model, ACM curriculum 68. Uh, Dijkstra wrote his cooperating sequential processes. So for all of you who have been beating your head against semaphores, blame him. <laughs> <laughs> he can take it. He's dead. <laughs> uh, he went, he... <laughs> Tell you, sir. Dijkstra had an immense ego. An immense ego. <laughs> all right? Immense. All right? And uh, at one point, I was at a conference where he was talking and doing his immense ego thing. And <laughs> one, of my, one of the guys near me turned around and says, you know, in computing, we measure intellectual arrogance in nano dykstras. <laughs> <laughs> but he was brilliant. That's the problem. He could pull it off. You know? All right? Dykstra wrote the go-to considered har harmful. How many of you have used the go-to in your programming languages? Not many. I'm sorry. I'm just about that. All right? Yeah, no, not very sorry. But, but he wrote this in 68. It was a letter to the editor of the ACM. Just absolutely turned things on its head. He said, look, there's no reason for it. You need loops, we have what? You need sequencing, we have that. You need conditions, we have this. Well, what do you need? Why do you need go-tos? People say, well, I gotta be able to get from here to there. He goes, you don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was, you know, that had a profound impact on the, uh, a profound impact. Languages developed after that either didn't have a whole a go-to or hit it. <laughs> that made it very inconvenient to use. Uh, Tony Hoare came up with quicksort. Uh, we came up with a way of describing the syntax of programming language called BNF, Bacchus Nauer form, uh, named after um, uh, John Bacchus and Peter Nauer. All right? And since we now had a way to capture the syntax of a programming language, it wasn't ad hoc, which it had been when Grace Murray Hopper and the Fortran guys were first worked. 
it meant you could actually write a program based upon the syntax. And so you could write a compiler by saying, okay, express, you know, statement equals variable assign expression. All right, fine. Statement, that's a procedure. Variable, that's a procedure. Equal sign, that's a literal. Expression, that's a recursive procedure. <laughs> All right? Bingo, you wrote these, you could write a recursive descent compiler, if they were called. All right? So we started having this notion, and that also affected greatly the syntax of programming languages. If you're wondering why C says imp something, it's because you want to know the type before you get the variable if you're doing it going recursive down. All right? You don't want to have, you want to, you don't want to see a whole um, other language of do, you know, variable, comma, variable, comma, variable, comma, variable, colon type. Well, that means you've got to keep track of all those variables until you come to the colon type to figure out what they are. Mm -hmm. If you say type first, all right, then you can just apply it to the variables that come across from it. They had an incredible effect on the syntax of languages. Things have gotten a lot better. We've got much power, more powerful tools now, but a lot of the reason C is the way it is, is to address, is to deal with that, that problem. All right. Okay, the 70s. Oh, man, cool. <laughs> All right, so let's say memory. Okay, core memory is slowly going away. By the end of the, by the, end of the 70s, it was gone. Nobody used magnetic core memory anymore. Other than, other than the federal government, because when you shoot something up in the air, the nicest thing about solid state memory is it tends to get really upset when it gets hit with beta and alpha particles and all this crap. Whereas magnetic core does not. It's much more immune to that. And so for a long time, until they could come up with really well hardened integrated circuits, uh, computers that went up in space had core memory in them, even though it was more, it weighed more and it was, more, it was bulkier. All right. We also saw the um, coming on the stage the era of the mini computer, the PDP 11. Oh, I love they did a journal noble, what a piece of junk. The very 620i. The nice thing about the PDP 11, it had a very regular instruction set. All right, didn't have any. There were very few exceptions to the rules about the way things went together. Whereas the Nova was like, you know, some psychotic engineer's <laughs> dream. All right, all right, and it just had weird instructions, and they, you know, they would do strange things. Oh, God. And a variant was, was somewhere in between. I love the PDP-11. Here it is, the 1134. There's its processor. That's the CPU, folks. That's the CPU on 1134. All right? Um, it was on its entire, its own circuit board. Uh, love this machine because, where is it here? No, we'll get to it on the, on the software page in a minute. So anyway, that's the PDP-11. Wonderful mini computer. Just People, people who worked on the 11 just loved it, all right? And the reason is, you're still writing a lot of software in assembly language most days, right? Um, it wasn't until, until C came out and really broke through at the end of the 70s that people would consider writing anything that was time critical in a language other than assembly language. So if you're writing an assembly language, you want a machine that is regular, okay? No, I want it gets constipated like the stupid data generator. <laughs> <laughs> I want it's regular. Okay? And the 11 was regular. Okay? Very nice. All right? Um, so th this was really the era of the mini computer. The 70s and up through uh, the early 80s, the mini computer. All right? Uh, but we started to see microcomputers. The Intel 4004 came out my third year in graduate school, so 1973 was totally useless, <laughs> other than as a proof of concept. All right, it had an ALU, it had, it had all this, but you know, it couldn't do anything, all right? Couldn't do anything useful, but hey, you take one look at it, oh crap. <laughs> By that time, we knew about Moore's Law, and we said, well, it can't do anything today, but in two years, it's going to do a lot, all right? So then that, that was followed by the 4040, which could do a little bit more. The 8008, which could almost do something interesting, and then the 8080, which is enough to actually power a computer powerful enough to do something that somebody cared about. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Um, and so what, we see, what you see here is the original Altair computer from, this, from the 70s, which was an 8080-based system. All right? Uh, your I.O. considered a magnetic tape. There are all sorts of really incredible ways you could take 
uh, 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 cassette tape and store software on them and actually get it on your computer and back again. I mean, the people who did this were absolute fanatics. People like um, oh, uh, Gates, Jobs, <laughs> people like that. They were fanatic. <laughs> All right. Uh, they saw something. I, got. I almost bought one of these. And my wife said, "You buy one of those, I'm divorcing." Oh. <laughs> I could have been rich. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, the Motorola 6800, which was Motorola's, actually a much cleaner machine. I'll tell you, the 8008 and the 8080 looked like they did because that. They, what we can cram so many transistors on this chip. That's basically it. What can we do with them? <laughs> all right. So they weren't, the construction sets were not designed by computer architects, they were designed by electrical engineers who were psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, Motorola 6800 was a much cleaner design. It was a stack-based computer, much cleaner. People, people who worked on that liked it a lot better. I didn't work a lot on it. I worked on the 8080, and I worked on the Fairchild F8, which was, made the 8080 look like, you know, PDB-11. I mean, that's, like, that's what a stupid piece of software that, that was. <laughs> But it was money. <laughs> they paid me to do it, I'll do it anyhow. I'm in grad school, I'll do anything for money. Okay? And then the big thing from my perspective, okay, from my perspective, was this was the era of user-level microprogramming. Computers were explicitly made with read-write memory that you could put your own microcode in and create your own instruction sets. And the group I was with at uh, Buffalo at the time, that was their research. They were in computer architecture. And we just had a ball. <laughs> All right. Uh, there was a system called the Nanodata QM1, which some people in the defense community still talk about fondly. It was developed in Buffalo off of that research group. Um, the PDP-1165 was a PDP-11 that you could turn into an IBM 1130 if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> the Burroughs D machine. Uh, was the first two-level microprogramming. You had a low-level, very wide instruction set computer that defined an intermediate, somewhat narrow instruction set computer, which defined the real instruction set. <laughs> those two levels of, of emulation. Uh, the machine I worked on most was the Burroughs B1700. And it and the PDP-11 were the two favorite machines. I've got, you know, I cry when I write things about The Burroughs 1700 was an amazing machine. Think of it, uh, you've worked with technology. You've worked with technology that doesn't quite fit. You know, the pieces, there's rough edges, things don't, but you've also worked, I'm certain, with some technology, you go, it fits. When I want to do something, it's obvious what to do. I feel that way about Ruby as a language, but there's <laughs> other things as well. You know, it's obvious what to do. I don't have to make any choices, I just do it, you know. <laughs> the 1700 were like that. If you were writing simulators, or emulators, as we call them, for other computer sets, it was obvious what to do. You know, <laughs> it's just obvious. It's, it, was just, it was designed to do that job well. It had bit addressable memory. So if you wanted a computer that was one, had one bit words, you could do it. Okay. <laughs> or six bits, or 13 bits, 17, anything you want. All right, bit addressable. If you want any bit memory, take up to 24 bits of a whack. All right? So it was, I mean, it had a lot, a lot of flexibility. So I was just, it was just a really cool machine. All right, so that's the hardware. Let's go to the software. What are we seeing? Ristus from DEC was, and uh, RMX, which is another one. But the big one, Unix. Okay, that's why I love the PDP-11. When I came here in 76, um, we had a PDP-1134. I don't know how they got it, but... Our department chair at the time was really good at getting stuff. <laughs> so we had 1134, and it wasn't lying idle. We were using it for stuff, but it wasn't being used all the time. And about a month after getting here, I went back to the University of Buffalo to see a, a talk. I just happened to decide, oh, what the heck, I'll go back. And the talk was by Brian Kernahan. And some of you remember when Kernahan was here a couple years ago. Well, he was a lot younger and well, was great at the time. And he came in and he said, I'm not talking about this system we use at Belmont called Unix. And by the end of his hour talk, I go, I gotta get me one of them. <laughs> you know, I don't care what it takes. You know, I mean, you know, he showed the whole thing with pipelines. I mean, he came up with a spell checker, which was based off of a pipeline. It was just so elegant. I go, oh, I gotta get me one of those. All right. So I went back, 
And I talked to our chair at the time, uh, Dr. Cheng, and uh, for whatever reason, he thought that was a good idea. So he gave me the 600 bucks. We sent two RK05 discs. They're about this big, and they held two and a half megabytes each. <laughs> sent them off to uh, the Bell Labs. They came back, uh, had a little bit of problem booting them up. So we called down, got a hold of Ken Thompson, and said, what's going on here? So we got to do this. All right, fine. So we did that. I mean, literally. So <laughs> <laughs> we got Ken Thompson in the research lab. We were stupid. We didn't know what this guy was. All right? And uh, booted it up, and that was that changed things. First of all, it meant that uh, the computer science department, which is what we had at the time, was now free of the Institute Computing Resources. We could do things that we wanted to do the way we wanted to. We had, we had a five user system running on that computer with five megabytes of disk, not five megabytes of memory, five megabytes of disk, 64K bytes of core, five user system. All right? Well, we got real work done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, languages. Pascal came out when I was still in grad school, and we brought it in here uh, at uh, at RIT in '77. Uh, it was the first reasonably structured language uh, that could be taught. All right. PL1 had structure, but it was really difficult to teach. So Pascal sort of took off. That was from Nicholas Worth. Uh, the, the guys out at Park were doing small talk, they had small talk 76, which was a recognizable but definitely older uh, ancestor of small talk we've seen today. Uh, C, obviously, you've got to use Unix, got to use C. And a language that came out of Carnegie Mellon called Bliss, which was used by DEC in most of their, most of their system software. All right? The big thing about Unix, it ran on a mini computer. I mean, here they couldn't get Multics to run on this humongous million dollar thing, and that's why it's called Unix, okay? Multics tried to do many things right, many things right. Thompson says, no, I want an operating system that does one thing right. <laughs> that's why it's called Unix. Uh, the vast majority of the operating system was written in a high level language. I know most of you don't think C is a high level language, but it is, all right? Okay? It's really higher level than assembly language. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was like, there was like 150 lines of assembly language, the rest of it was all in C. All right, um, and we started to see some work in databases. Uh, at the beginning of the decade, Codasil came up with a network database model, which you viewed as nodes and links and all that stuff, basically. Uh, shortly thereafter, Todd came up with his relational database theory and all the stuff about normalization. There was no SQL, but the idea of relations, tables, and how they could join, and normalization, and all that stuff. And then about five years later, Chen came up with his entity relationship models for modeling database systems. And that was a big step forward. I know you guys like no SQL, and I like no SQL. <laughs> but believe me, all right, uh, no SQL doesn't mean no structure at all. And that's what things looked like before. Uh, HCI, Xerox had the Alto workstation, which was arguably the first personal computer. Yeah, it cost $50,000, but it was a personal computer. <laughs> Uh, with the Bravo text editor, which was the, is the lineal ancestor of any text editor you've ever used, whether it's Google Write or Microsoft Word or whatever. All, right. All the base ideas were set in Bravo uh, in the 70s. And other things, the, you know, visual editors like VI and Emacs, because now you, you had a computer that you could run them on. You, know, you had time sharing, you could run them on a mini computer. You didn't have to depend on the, the people at the central computing lab to let you run the stuff. You know? <laughs> Just did it. All right, the notion of components and pipelines, which has become now an architectural style, was promoted by Unix. Homebrew computing clubs, and just to show this is a, this is the simplest world, world simplest Pascal program. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, that's where it came from. All right, and then what about the profession? Well, now we start getting real uh, papers on things that are recognizably software engineering. Parnas is classic on the criteria to be used, decomposing systems into modules which is the basis for encapsulation information hiding all that. Though he didn't call it that in this paper. You read that and you go, God, this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> he's actually written a program once in a while, right? Uh, Brooks came out with the Mythical Man Month, which was the first thing on man project management for computing and uh, uh, what, you know, based on his experience with the, uh, uh, the OS 360. Uh, Dijkstra won the Turing Award, entitled his Talk the humble programmer and everybody boom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First international conference on software engineering. 
uh, occurred in that in uh, 74. Uh, Parnas had two great follow-ups on the design and development of program families. All right, so you, you may have heard of product line engineering, 1974. All right, designing software for ease of extension and contraction. You've heard of tailable systems, 1976. All right, so a lot of these things have been out in the air. Some of them just weren't practical at the time. They've been out there for a long time. All right, so we'll go to the 80s. All right, what do we have? We have VLSI microcomputers, the PC, the Apple II, eventually the Mac. Here's the Osborne, here's the first portable computer, the Osborne 1 portable, call, weighed about all 15 pounds. Yeah, look at it, luggable is what it was, if you're lucky. <laughs> all right, as you can see, the screen's just a tad small. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I was never really interested in that, I have to admit. Okay. We also saw the arrival of mini mainframes, like the VAX 11 7X0, here's a 780. Uh, Data General came up with a follow-on, which was even more disgusting than the uh, <laughs> Nova called the Eclipse. Mm -hmm. HP came out with the HP 3000, which was a really nice machine, just never took off. All right. Uh, the VAX was cool, because not only did it run VAX code, which is 32-bit code, it also emulated a PDP-11. You could put it in emulator mode and it run like a PDP-11. So you could run all your PDP-11 PDP programs on I spent the um, New Year's Eve, 19... <laughs> this is the kind of geek I am, right? <laughs> New Year's Eve, 1981, we have a program called Spitball, which was a particular high-performance version of Snowball that we used in DLC. And we hadn't been able to get it to run. So New Year's Eve, 1981, in my basement, you know, with a 30 character <laughs> second terminal. Yes! <laughs> okay. Running in, in compatibility mode on the backs. Uh, and we started to see toward the end of the 80s workstation, the Sun 350, Apollo, which is a dear departed computer system. Um, and we started to see things like the ARPANET, the ARPANET running at an entire 56 kilobytes per, kilobits per second. Uh, but hey, it's better than, you know, 300 characters a second, 300 bits a second. So uh, we tied into this, Larry Kuhn, who was a colleague here, retired about 10 years ago. Uh, Larry was the one who got the, the grant from the uh, uh, NSF to hook us into CSNet, which was backbone site that fed into the internet. That's how we got our, that's how we got our internet address. That's why we've got a class B license. <laughs> we got there early. <laughs> Not as early as MIT, but we got there early. Not as early as the Vatican. The Vatican has a class A license. <laughs> pull, pull strings. All right. <laughs> ah, 80 software, MS DOS, less of the better. Uh, <laughs> that more or less, such as it was, it was a piece of crap. It wasn't really an operating system. All right, it was a bunch of code at the bottom of your computer memory. All right, that's what it was. Um, uh, didn't have didn't have uh, uh, preemptive scheduling, which meant if you took over the computer with an infinite loop, you could do reboot. <laughs> the Atari, which probably your parents uh, may have played on, gotten games on, all that stuff. All right, languages. Small talk eighty. Small talk seventy six. Grown up. Small talk we all know of today. Huge. You know, not many people have used it, but it's influenced a lot of people, including Mots, the guy who did uh, Ruby. You can just feel small talk underneath Ruby. Not the concrete syntax, but the conceptual basis for it. You just say, that's small talk. All right. Uh, Modulo, which was Nicholas Worth's follow-on to uh, Pascal. C++, we all know about that. Um, <laughs> Starting to get real databases, Oracle and Postgres came out. And now we start seeing tools. SCCS and RCS, version control. SCCS won the first. Uh, International Conference on Software Engineering Award for Innovation. Ten, they always give it 10 years after the paper's published to make certain it actually had an effect. All right? And uh, it, won that, it won the first award. Okay? By today's standard, it's poverty stricken, but given what we had then, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> um, we had networks, Usenet and BitNet. We were on Usenet. Yeah, it was just, you know, you'd call up, we'd call up the University of Rochester five times a day and exchange mail. No. And then they forward it on to wherever it had to go. Uh, CompuServe, the first sort of online forum. Uh, from a design thing and analysis, we had data flow diagrams and structure charts. Uh, those got um, superseded fairly quickly when the object 
technology took over. Though people who do real-time control still like them because they tend, real-time control tends to be much more functional than data-driven. Uh, tools for doing compilers, lots and yak, and one of the first tools to actually allow you to do pattern matching and putting around with stuff, take a string, munge it, send it back out called awk. Why was it called awk? Aho, Weinberger, and Kernahan. <laughs> All right, they were the guys who wrote it. Okay. Uh, it's still there on every Unix and uh, SigWin system today. And a profession. Okay, Parnas shows up again. Uh, his rational design process, how and why to fake it, everybody should read that. Because <laughs> it basically says, look, we all know that design is not a rational process. You have insight, and you have stupid, you have to make mistakes, all right? But at the end of the day, you've got to design. And if you've done a good job, what you printed it up with is probably pretty good, even though it looked like crap along the way. So pretend that it was perfect from the beginning, right? <laughs> why, you know, how and why to fake a rational design process? You know, mathematicians have been doing this for centuries. You do not want to see the first draft of most proofs. <laughs> you know, they dress it up. Those I just I sat on a train one day and it pink, no baloney. You know, same thing here. All right. So I would suggest read. It's a great paper from the from the eighties. Uh, Brooks came back with a classic no silver bullet, which basically said there's no magic we're ever going to find that's going to make software development easier. Software development is hard. That's not what they keep telling. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> that's it, right? Software development is hard. Okay, it's intrinsically difficult. You talked about Aristotle in there. Really cool. Yeah. All right, DeMarco came out with his early book on controlling software projects, one of the first books on use of metrics to keep track of what was happening within a project. Bain came out with his famous software engineering economics and his model for productivity. Uh, the SEI was created, and from it came version one of the capability and maturity model. Um, a lot of us have problems with the specifics of the capability maturity model, but the idea was fine. You ought to know whether you're good or bad. The idea of the capability maturity model is to tell you, you know, whether you're doing good practices or not. Okay? It got a little twisted because Watts Humphrey had his... How do I say this? The man's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Obsessive compulsive. I guess with the way you would say it. And so, you know, I mean, he, he wrote his book from front to back, and he wrote his table of contents from back to front, and they met in the middle. <laughs> All right, this is the kind of guy he was, right? Okay. Um, me, I just throw away pages. You know. Okay. So, the 90s, hardware, risk computers, and cash members of poor folks, like us, you now they got put in there. High-speed internet, cable, and DSL, but about this time, they said, really, who cares? <laughs> it's all generic now, you know? I mean, the really neat days of, 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 of experimenting with cool architectures, by and large, has left, with the exception now, coming back around, all right, are these uh, graphic processor boards, GPU boards, which bring a whole new spin back. There was a, an attempt in the 80s and 90s to create uh, high-speed parallel, not concurrent, parallel computing, which means you do the same thing on independent data sets. That's parallel. All right? So if you're adding up of two vectors, you can add up each pair independently. They don't affect each other. So if you can partition your program into that, then you can send a lot of data streams through and get very high throughput. Uh, the Thinking Machines was the first attempt to do that. It had a, looked really cool, but it just, it just never made it. But now with these GPUs, man, Watch it, they're, 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 I, I think that's going to be the next one. Okay? That's the next, that's the first time in about 15 years I've really gotten excited about hardware development, you know, conceptual hardware development. All right. Software, well, Unix has been around forever. Now, if the old guy in the block, uh, Linux, which is Linus's redesigned version of Unix, because Andrew Tannenbaum wouldn't let him use Linux. <laughs> Did you ever hear this term? Why Linus came, why, where Linux came from? You know, Linus Torvalds was hanging around up in Finland, of all places. <laughs> all right, read a book on operating systems by Andrew Tannenbaum, one of the leaders in the field. In it, Tannenbaum had described his small Unix light, but, but really stripped down the system called Minix. Uh, Torvalds said, gee, I'd like to take that and move it on 
And Tanner Mom said no, and so Torvald said, okay, I'll do it all myself. Pretty good. <laughs> all right, Windows, uh, you yeah. <laughs> know. There you go, I want uh, Languages, Eiffel. How many people here have ever heard of Eiffel? Uh, Eiffel's a cool language, it really is. It just, it just, it, they just could not get enough performance out of it at the time. Its type checking was extremely sophisticated from when it came out. So you just couldn't get that, you couldn't do the type checking. Um, uh, Java, obviously, Python, Ruby, the web. There's a big one. <laughs> Nothing to do with hardware. I, but I can remember, I, all right, I'll tell you. What the heck. 1990, 1993, your faithful servant is sitting in his room over Building 10, which is where my office was at the time, and reading some new news that article. And someone says, there's a, uh, a browser for this thing called the World Wide Web. It's available at NCSA. Seems cool. Let's try it out. Okay, what the heck? It's an easy day. Downloaded it, fired it up, and I go, good God, this is cool. <laughs> and there were no pictures. It was gray background text and hyperlinks. That's all you had. But I said, this is good. This is going to rock. <laughs> I was going to ask how many days later you realized that you should leave. <laughs> right. yeah. This is going to rock. This, this kid, Mark Andreessen, who's now worth 20 times what I am, 2,000 times what I am. You know, was putzing around out at NCSA doing this. Uh, I sent in some of the earliest bug reports on Mosaic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, I said, this is, this is going to rock. And everybody said, so cool. I said, look at this. Just look at this and just look at the possibility. <laughs> okay. Uh, four years later, there was the first <laughs> ad based on the web that had a web address in it. <coughs> IBM at the Sugar Bowl in 1996. At midfield was selling, trying to sell OS2. They were trying to beat out Microsoft, right? Big chance for that. OS2, www.os2.ibm.com. I go, it's arrived. <laughs> 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 all right. So I, I, I give all credit to the guys out at, at NCSA who did it, and Tim Berners Lee who came up with the idea. I mean, you know, I can't, you, know, you can't imagine <laughs> what it was like to be in school. In the 60s and 70s, you can, in the 60s and 70s, and try to find an article about something. You had to go to this thing called a library. <laughs> and, uh, if you're lucky, it hadn't been ripped out by the person before you who was trying to screw you in your class. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? I mean, I made, this I made this thing up last night and this morning. I said, do you like a picture of a PDP-11? <laughs> What are Maurice Wilkes looks like? <laughs> cool. So, you know, the, the web has changed a lot. I'm reading a book now, actually, which talks about how it is actually changing, potentially changing our own neural pathways, because it turns out the, the human brain is extremely plastic and is very able to adapt to, to stuff. And there's this guy, he sort of riffing on, well, what does this mean? He talks about how he has his, low, his, tensions, his, his uh, tension span has dropped a lot. It's difficult for him to read a novel, so because he's so used to just reading snap, 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 snap off the web. All right, I haven't gotten there yet, but I think that's my brain slow. All right, and a profession. All right, so uh, Watts Humphrey did his personal software process, followed by his team software process. I'll tell you, you read these books, read every other one. <laughs> because his idea, when he talks about conceptually what he's trying to do, and even conceptually how he wants to go about it, go, yeah, that makes sense. And then you go a little further on, you realize, you know, this guy really is obsessive compulsive. <laughs> you know, I can't live like that. All right? Uh, the design patterns, actually, they came out in the 80s, put them on the place. Uh, followers refactoring. Oh, no, no, design patterns did come out in the 90s. Uh, 94, followers refactoring, uh, the unified modeling language, and for you as undergraduate software engineering at RIT. That's what I'm going to do. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. I had a blast giving the talk. Well, you can watch it again. <laughs> Are you taking questions? Sure! Um, oh, so I've got opinions about everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I, I've got two. I'll, I'll ask one and I'll let others, and then maybe if there's time, I'll ask another one. 
Um, so the P2P11, as I recall, came with Space War so that the guy installing it could make sure everything was plugged in. Yes. Did you ever play any of it? No. Because okay. by, by the time we got it, it was gone. And, and I was interested in running Unix. I could run better games than Unix. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> better games than Unix. <laughs> you know. um, no, what you're thinking of, no, it wasn't the PDP-11. It was the PDP... Oh, God, it wasn't the 8. The PDP-7, I think, became the Space War. Um, well, actually, that's what, that's what Ken Thompson wrote the Unix system for. He wanted to run Space Wars. And he's been able to run it for a while. Um, GE, MIT, and Bell Labs have been working on Moltex. And then Bell Labs pulled out. And he says, well, I can't play Space Force anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so he so just found this unused PDP, I think it was a PDP 7, maybe a PDP 9. Unused PDP computer sitting in a corner somewhere. And he sort of squirreled it into his cube and started writing <laughs> Unix so he could write Space Force. Right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, he said, well, how are we going to make, you know, how are we going to make, how are we going to get the, how are we going to get the brass to give us any stuff? I mean, this, you know, 8K of memory was, 8K, 8K of memory was a budget line item at the division level. Right? <laughs> he says, how are we going to get them to give us the money that we need to do this? And they said, oh, we'll create a typesetting system for the, uh, the uh, word processing staff. All right, that's where Enroth came from, and T-Roth. Okay? Joseph Osana did that, they gave him the PDP-11, and they go, great, put it in the corner, we're going to Space Force. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a story about um, uh, the, uh, the word processing pool, back when they had them, at the lab. My brother was there, and um, in the, he was doing, finishing up his dissertation, and so he'd written, and it was a very theoretical dissertation, it was on formal semantics and snowball. Okay. Anyway, he did that, and so he did what every mathematician would do, is all of his theorems were in the form, you know, so-and-so, if and if that. So he'd write so-and-so, I, if, if, that. You come back at him, that's not a word. We can't type that. That's not in our, that's not in our, our approved list of words. <laughs> it's a well-known mathematical term. Can't do it. Every I, F, F in his theorem was changed to if and only if. Every single one. <laughs> anyway, talk about corporate stuff. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, hobbies. What hobbies have you had with creating computers? Have you ever built one? I never built a computer. I love. I. I you saw the thing. Electricity. Man. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, I kill myself. Uh, no. Um, my hobbies have always been writing software. I just love writing software. I like writing. I've written assemblers. I've written compilers. I've written pieces of operating systems. Ported Unix to a new system. That's my. Uh, that's my. What cool. system? Uh, Sixty-eight thousand back in the early eighties. Did, uh, Tropel. Okay, got a paper out of it too because we did it in a very innovative way. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to read it? Go back. Unix, 1981 or 82. Mike Sean, who's a graduate of the CS program, and I did the work. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was a ball. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I just like writing so I like designing and writing software. Okay, really don't have an awful. I now buy a computer. <laughs> never had, never really had much of an interest in building one. Right? It's like, you know, I drive cars, I don't have an interest in building one. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Shoot. Okay, uh, so I'm actually doing a, a bit of a history research paper on the, the MIT, a, the building the MIT AI lab. And right. Mac was. And um, one of the summon bots I hit is uh, I'm trying to nominate the building for a National Register on the and I need to know, do you have to know if Richie or Thompson actually worked in that building, or did they work from Bell Labs remotely? I think they worked from Bell Labs remotely. I think. Yeah, of course it ought to be. You know, so should the Stanford AI lab. Um, you know, a lot of great stuff was done. Yeah. Yeah. Still the best, still the best typesetting language for mathematics, isn't it? even though you type it in. You know, it's a, a markup language. I beat the crap out of anything word or anything else I've seen you do. You know, unless you want to sit there all day getting, you know, a couple tones and run like click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Did you keep in contact with Grace Hopper? Um, I saw her at several conferences after that. I never formally got, but I would see her at conferences and we'd chat for a few minutes and then she'd be whisked away to some big 
you know, VIP place, and I'd be left holding my chip Ever hear of my number? Huh? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> a little old for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. I've had a ball. I'll see you <laughs>